Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Longfellow and McLean parents. And welcome to our author talk for, for the book, What Do You Say? How to Talk with Kids to Build Motivation, Stress Tolerance, and a Happy Home. My name is Kathleen O'Tall, and I am one of the counselors here at McLean High School. Well, not really here, but at McLean High School. I'm so excited to be hosting this event. I know that all of us are adjusting to being back to school in person with the joys and struggles that that can bring. After almost a year and a half of staying home during the pandemic, we as parents can really use some back to basics refreshers as we go about the hardest and most important job we will ever have. This book provides not only these refreshers we need, but a lot of new tips and advice that will prove invaluable to us as parents. As you can see, I've bookmarked and highlighted this book like crazy. Lots of highlights in here, lots of bookmarks. And I'm so glad you all are here to learn what this book has to offer. I use the tips not only from this book, but also from the author's first book, which is called The Self-Driven Child, when I talk with parents in my role as a school counselor all the time. Before I introduce our authors and speakers today, I just want to get a little feedback on how you all are feeling about the first two months of your child being back at school. So I'm gonna open up the chat window and you're gonna to go to the chat icon. Probably most of you know how to do this on Zoom, but go to the chat icon at the bottom of your screen and open up the chat window. Then click on the little smiley face to the bottom right of the chat window and a lot of emojis will pop up. What I want you to do is choose one emoji that best describes how you are feeling about the kids being back at school and how your parenting life has been going since we started back. I'll give a couple of minutes for people to respond. Oh, it looks like we've got some happy faces, a little sweat on one of the faces. Oh, good. Lots of happy faces so far. <laughs> I like the upside down up. Oh, someone's having a little bit of a hard time adjusting. <laughs> nice, okay. Lots of happy ones, some sad ones, some a little bit stressed out. Seems like most of us are happy to be back in person. That's great. Thank you all so much for sharing. Um, and for housekeeping, before I introduce our authors, for housekeeping, please note that this session is being recorded and questions as well as responses in the chat window will be visible in the recording. Our authors will take time to answer questions at the end of the presentation. So I'm going to close the chat window during the presentation and open it back up when they're finished with their presentation and parents will be able to ask questions. Now let me introduce our authors. William Sticksrud, PhD, is a clinical neuropsychologist and founder of the Sticksrud Group, as well as a faculty member at Children's National Medical Center and an assistant professor of psychiatry and pediatrics at the George Washington University School of Medicine. He is also the co-author with Ned Johnson of the national best-selling book, The Self-Driven Child, and of their new book, the book that we'll be talking about tonight, What Do You Say? Talking with Kids to Build Motivation, Stress Tolerance, and a Happy Home. Dr. Sticks Root's work has been featured in media outlets such as NPR, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Times of London, The Wall Street Journal, U.S. News and World Report, Time Magazine, Scientific American, Business Week, Barron's, and New York Magazine. He is a longtime practitioner of transcendental meditation, and he plays in the rock band Close Enough. Ned Johnson is an author, speaker, and founder of Prep Matters, an educational company provided, providing academic tutoring, educational planning, and standardized test preparation. A professional tutor geek since 1993 and battle-tested veteran. Clean. 
stress regulation, and student performance, Ned has spent more than 40,000 one-on-one hours helping students conquer an alphabet of standardized tests, learning to manage their anxiety, and the motivation to reach their full potential. In 2006, Ned co-authored the book, Conquering the SAT, How Parents Can Help Students Overcome the Pressure and Succeed, which tackles the outsized role anxiety plays in standardized testing. With Dr. William Sticks Rood, Ned co-authored The Self-Driven Child, The Science and Sense of Giving Your Kids More Control Over Their Lives, which explores how fostering children's autonomy can help solve two challenges seemingly endemic to kids today, handling anxiety and developing intrinsic motivation. Ned is the host of the Prep Talks podcast, Conversations with Parenting and Education Experts, a sought after speaker and team coach on study skills, sleep deprivation, parent teen dynamics and test anxiety. And his work is featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal and many others. So I'm going to give it up for Bill and Ned right now and let them take it away. Hopefully they're here. Hmm. Hmm. I do not know if they're here or not. Oh, there's Ned. Hi, Ned. <laughs> oh, hello, Kathleen. I just introduced you. I appreciate <laughs> Bill, I don't know that. where Bill is. <laughs> um, I just gave I will, your bio. I really appreciate that. Let me just... Uh... Let me just let him know we're oh, having there he is. There's the fabulous Dr. William Stixrud. Um, hey, folks. I, hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to apologize really quickly on my behalf and we're going to hand the baton to Bill. Uh, we had a bit of a uh, logistical snafu at our end. Um, so I'm going to be with you for a while. And you can see me. I'm, I had plans with my family. And I didn't know that this was, I was going to be part of it. So I, I think of myself as making a cameo with you all tonight. Uh, but I'm really excited to be with here for the time that it will be. Uh, and then I'm going to disappear. Um, but Bill, uh, Kathleen was kind enough to give an introduction to us. We got a whole bunch of folks here. Uh, do we want to just jump right in and talk about? I, I do. I, how to I'm motivate? Sorry. How to tie yeah. to build motivation, stress tolerance, and a happy home? Okay. So the first thing I want to say is that um, you know that people are, people say it, and rightly so, that parenting is really hard, and, and it's true that that. That is, is, I think it's particularly hard since the, since the pandemic and, and the, the advent of the internet, social media. But um, in, in probably 1988, I tested a kid whose mother was a humorist. And she said, you know, we really shouldn't call it raising children. We should call it lowering parents. You know, I think it's always been humbling and, and, and challenging. And so Ned and I wrote The Self-Driven Child. It came out in 2018. And then about a year later, our agent said, why don't you write another book? People love the dialogue. When you basically say, tell parents, here's it, try saying this. And it made sense to us because so often, you know, parents say, well, I've told him a million times. I, I keep trying to get him to see, or I just, you know, I, I nag him, I'm on him all the time. I don't know what else to do. And you know, Ned and I, between the two of us, have been um, have been talking with kids for probably sixty five or seventy years altogether, one on one. So we figured, you know, we can probably do this. Um, and so um, we 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 decided to um, write, write this book about communicating with kids and talking with kids. And in our first book, the self driven child. We, the, the thesis is that having a sense of control over your own life is hugely beneficial for kids because it's like a, it, 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 it's, it's extremely beneficial from a stress kind of mental health point of view, but also that sense of control or autonomy is really the key to, to an internal or, or an intrinsic motivation. And when we started to write about communication, we said we need to take a step back. And that, that autonomy, sense of control is huge. But the most important part of communication is really building connection. So let, let's take a step back and talk about connection. And we knew that having a close relationship with the parent is about as close as you can get to having a silver bullet for protecting kids against the harmful effects of stress. 
And we also knew that, uh, that kids in, who come from relatively affluent parents in high achieving schools are at much higher risk for anxiety disorders and, and depression and self-cutting and substance use disorders, even until the mid twenties, at least in the mid twenties. And one of the hypotheses is that they feel this excessive pressure to excel, but also that they, on average, they don't feel as close to their parents as, as kids, middle-class kids, or kind of even kind of kids living in, in, near the poverty line. And so we figured that this connection is, is really important. And, and we asked, when we were writing the book, we asked dozens of kids, who do you feel most close to? And sometimes they said one, one of their parents, but often they said, you know, is a teacher or a tutor or a counselor or, or an, an uncle or an, or an older cousin. And we said, what is it about those, that person that makes you feel close? And invariably the kids said, said something to the effect of, they listen to me without judgment and they don't tell me what to do. And we, there's a story in the book about the, the, these kids who just go to this teacher, even though they didn't have the teacher, they didn't know the teacher from, they never had her for a class, but she just listened to them. And if they, if they asked for advice, she'd give them advice, but she didn't tell them what to do. And this made sense to us because we, we know that, that a sense of research says just the key to building a close relationship with kids is empathy and validation, is letting kids know we're trying to understand their feelings and letting them know that, that their feelings are normal. Now, do you want to take over for a little bit? Can't hear you, Ned. So, so until Ned, I'll take over until Ned, uh, we can hear Ned. Um, but in, in any, you there, Ned? Oh, so in any case, um, <clears throat> we, we talked to, um, we talked to a guy by the name of Aron Magan, who is uh, he's an Israeli guy who is um, a brilliant guy about communicating with kids. And Ned, just jump in any time, buddy. And, yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, go, go take oh, it. Oh boy, I'm just going to be a problem all night long. Um, <laughs> so we, we start our book with a chapter about empathy and validation, in part because, as, as Bill said, it, you know, this, this close connection between a parent and a kid, it's about as close as you get to a silver bullet against the effects of stress. And golly knows, most of us got, and our kids included, have more than, more than enough right now. But also, for us as parents, if we have, if we have you know, advice we want to give, we want to give support, we want to help our kids, we want to be, we want to be able to communicate in a way that makes them able to hear and, and willingly take the advice that we accept, that, that we're, we'll offer. I mean, there, there can be nothing more frustrating as a parent than, than having a kid who you can see is struggling, and you, and you start trying to, you know, what about this? You start giving give advice, and they go, well, Dad, you just don't understand at all, and they, and they kind of run away. And so we really looked hard at what is it that really makes kids or makes any of us able to, to be in a state that we can hear and, and accept advice and really communicate effectively. Because here's why, it's, logic doesn't come hard emotions. And I'm sure that every parent who's on this, on this call tonight has had the experience of, of, of having offering what's some really good advice some really good wisdom and have it kind of blow up in our face a little bit. And so it, when we use empathy and validation, it, that's what calms kids' hard emotions and puts them in a position where they're much more likely to be able to hear what it is that we have to say. And so empathy and validation, it's important to make a note here, it isn't agreeing with the other person. It's simply saying there are reasons why you feel the way that you do. And those, and those feelings that you have are valid, whether or not we agree on the circumstances. So if you have a kid who comes home, who, you know, bursts in the door and then bursts into tears and so I did terribly on that test. It was so unfair. I studied like crazy. And Mr. Johnson put things on there. What did he even see if it was going to be on there? And the kid's spinning and you're thinking, study, buddy, you, 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 you played hours on uh, playing Fortnite, right? You, you, you dialed it in, you know, and Mr. Johnson's the most straightforward teacher in the history of teaching. Give me a break. Or... We tend to say things like, oh, come on, kiddo, it's only one test. You'll be fine. I mean, look, it, it, everyone gets a bad grade. You'll make it up the next time. And so when we jump into kind of problem solving or trying to talk kids out of the hard feelings, it makes them feel like we're not taking their side, we're, we're, we, we don't see where they're coming from. And what we can say with empathy and validation is something like, um, gosh, I can see how upset you are. It must be pretty frustrating to feel like you really worked hard to prepare for a test and it didn't go well. Note, 
I didn't say you did prepare hard for the test, right? I simply said, it must feel hard. If you felt that you prepared really hard, you know, or gosh, I'd be really frustrated too. If I felt like the teacher put a bunch of things on the test that they didn't, he didn't tell us was going to be on here. And it's the experience of feeling listened to that calms hard emotions. And as we talk about in the self-driven child, when we can be in our right minds, we can help our kids get into the right minds. It puts them into a position where they can actually put things in perspective for themselves or figure out solutions for you know, the next go round for themselves. So there's a story in the book, Bill and I were out in Palo Alto and, and given, given a talk. And the next morning, the next afternoon, we get an email from the, the forwarded to us um, from a mom who attended the lecture. And she said, I came home last night and I found my seventh grader in tears. And he was, he was just so upset. And he said, mom, I'm the weakest boy in all of seventh grade. And he was just a mess. And she said, normally I would have said, oh, sweetheart, that can't possibly be true. Or you have so many other skills. You have so many other gifts. We don't, you know, we don't have to be good at everything or, or try to figure out a solution. I'll talk to the coach. You know, and I would have jumped into problem solving mode. But I just listened to you guys. And I said, well, let me try this another way. And so I simply use this empathy and validation and say, gosh, you sure seem pretty upset. Do you want to tell me more about it? And you did. And I said, gosh, I'd be upset too if I felt like I was really weak when I wanted to be strong and everyone else is stronger than I am. And he sort of, you know, dried his eyes a little bit and said, gosh, you know, thanks, mom. And, 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 and she said, I did this in part because I didn't know quite what else to say. And, you know, I gave him a hug and a kiss and, and he, he went off to bed and I went off to bed. And here's the great part. The next morning, he comes down to breakfast with a plan, oh, sorry, a written plan for how he's gonna to try to gain strength. And says, mom, can you, can you help me with this? And he of his own had realized it's not the end of the world. I'm not stuck where I am. And here's what a plan is going forward. And so we started this book with empathy and validation because as parents, we all have wisdom. We all have experience. We all have ideas of how we can help our kids in part because we've walked this ourselves, walk this walk ourselves. But we start with this because if we wanna be effective in communicating good ideas, we first have to have kids feel like they're understood and then we can help them understand where we're coming from. Yeah. And one of the things I like about, I love about this, Ned, is that some of the stuff in the book, you know, take, take, a lot of this, the things we recommend, take some practice. But th this is an example of just, just something that, that, that the energy changed and, 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 and we got results almost immediately. It, is, uh, it took, took you know, eight hours or 10 hours or something. Right, right, right. You know, but, but, and the other interesting thing is, is I, I, I think in, in the example of the kid who didn't study for the test, and you know that, they're much more likely if, if we say, if we, we use empathy and validation to come on their own and say, well, I didn't really, I, mean, I didn't really study that major. I probably need to study more. And that, that's where we want them to be. Right, right. And then because I, I, I had the time wrong, wrong we're going to have you longer than we thought. Exciting. Um, should, should, should I, I'll just go ahead and do the, the next right piece then. Okay. Yep. So, um, so we start out with empathy and validation. And then we revisit some of the themes that we, we touched on in, in the self-driven child, um, including one, one of the main kind of theses is, is that we think that as kids get older, it makes sense for parents, to, for, for us as parents to think about ourselves more as consultants to our kids whose role it is to help our kids figure out who they want to be, what kind of life they want, and how to create it, than it is that they're being their boss or their manager, somebody who always, always knows best and always tell them what to do. And there's three implications of, of this parent as consultant idea. One is that ideally we offer help, we offer our advice, we offer our wisdom, we offer our wisdom but we don't try to force it down kids' throats. And we don't try to, for, unless kids are suicidal or they're very drug involved, we don't try to force help on them that they don't need because we don't want them using their incredible adolescent energy, resisting people's attempts to help them. And we don't want them just, just batting away all, 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 our, our sage wisdom. We, we want them to, to, to think about it and appreciate it. So the first, the first implication is that we offer help and advice. We don't try to force it. You know, Ned has this great cartoon where this dad has, has, has his sons by the nape of the neck. And he's saying, listen up boys and listen up good because I'm only going to tell you this a million times. You know, and and we, we, aren't, we aren't so hot on that. The second implication is that we want kids as much as possible to make decisions for themselves. And I, I felt my whole career that the best message you can give a teenager besides I love you is that I have confidence in your ability to make decisions about your own life and to learn from your mistakes. And I want you to have a ton of practice doing that before you, you, you leave home. 
And so with little kids, we give them choices, we, we, but we, and we, we treat them respectfully. They, they, they got a brain in their head. They have learned practices. And adolescents, more and more, we require them to make the important decisions with, our, with consultation with us. We want them to have, that's how you become a good decision maker. That's how you develop confidence in your own judgment as you practice. And the third implication is that as much as possible, we want kids to solve their own problems. Because what, what, what happens if, if a five-year-old or a 10-year-old, 15-year-old has, has a problem and, and we don't, and, and the, the, the universe doesn't rush, rush in to solve it for them, they have to wrestle with it. And when they wrestle with it, what happens is their, their prefrontal cortex activates. And when the prefrontal cortex activates, it dampens down the stress response. So, so they go into coping mode. And what we want is kids who have a lot of experience going into coping mode, solving their own problems, because that's what de de develops the connections in the brain where that prefrontal cortex regulates the, the stress system. And that's what, kids give, that's what gives kids confidence that they can manage stressful situations in their own life. You know, and I, I, I gave a lecture in, in Houston uh, right before the pandemic uh, about our book and about our first book. And I happened to mention one of the most elite independent schools in, in, in the in DC area. And I don't remember why, but afterward, this, this, this uh, woman came up and said, I, I'm, a, I'm a therapist at the Menninger Clinic here in, 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 this, the, in Houston, this excellent mental health uh, clinic in, in Houston. She, says, she said, we know this independent school in Washington very well because so many of the graduates get into the most elite colleges, but they can't handle it emotionally. So they take a medical leave and they come here for treatment. And she said, 201, they just don't simply have that experience of running their own life, making their decisions, solving their own problems. They, they jump through hoops, but they don't have the experience of running their own life. And our goal, ultimately, what we want is for kids to be able to run their own life before they leave home, before we send them into the most dysregulated living environment outside of a war zone, namely a college dormitory. So we, we talk about in, in, in this in our chapter on the non on this idea as parents consulting. We talk about the language of the parent consultant, and, and, and we talk about two things. One is that is the language of getting buy-in. You know, rather than blathering on our t t t telling a kid a million times, what we say, we just say stuff like, you know, I've got a, I got an idea. Can I run it by you? You know, or um, right, you know, is, is there a way that I could help? Or I wonder what would happen if you if you tried it this way. And one that I use a lot is for whatever for for whatever it's worth. And then I'll just say, you may want to think about this, but, but we're, 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 we're tentative and we're offering, but, but, but we, aren't trying, we aren't trying to lay stuff on the kid. And the second is, is what we call the language of no force, or, the, or may the power of no force be with you. The idea being when kids feel forced, they resist. And what we, what, what we do with little kids is we say, look, I, I couldn't make you do that. Obviously, I'm not trying to make you, all you'd have to do is flop to the floor. I couldn't make you. And, and with, with teenagers too, we want to let them know that um, you know, one of the lines from the first book is, I love you too much to fight with you about your homework. You know, and, and I, I'm not, I couldn't make you do it, but I'm happy to be your homework consultant. Um, and, and also we just don't want to, we don't want people in kids' lives working harder than they do to develop themselves because uh, it, it, that doesn't change until the energy changes. So we talk about the, the language of parent consultant uh, being this, particularly this, this getting buy-in to share our advice and our wisdom and suggestions, and also just being clear that we aren't trying to force. And we also talk about the, the, uh, an idea from our first book about this idea that it's really great in families when parents serve as a non-anxious presence. And Ned, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, me, me, a couple of things. One, because you know, so much of our, our, our both books is really posited on the idea that the most important outcome of high school and adolescence is not where kids go to college, and I say this as a test prep guy, but the brains that they're going to develop and, and carry into college and, and, into, and into life. And we very purposely chose the subtitle of stress tolerance, because just as Bill was saying, it's when kids deal with something that's a little intense, they get this, ma but then they, they handle it well. And, and they have the experience of going from things that are intense to feeling like this is, a, the world's okay and I can handle this and kind of a little bit more stress and, and stress recovery that wires brains to have stress tolerance. And, and, and the strength of those connections that Bill mentioned, those are the single best marker of mental health in human brains. So it's really an important thing. Now, for both that, you know, have stress and then full stress recovery, and for us as parents to be effective in communicating with kids, it helps a lot 
if we are, are, are well, we just, what, we stole this term from a, a guy named Edwin Freeman. If we can act as non-anxious presence, or at least move in that direction, so that home is, is more calm, you know, and less scared than the world outside. And Edwin Friedman made this point that things just go better when the, the people in charge, the, the leaders, the parents, aren't overly emotional, aren't overly reactive, um, partly because all emotions are contagious, right? So fear is contagious, but so is calm. And, you know, Bill and I started doing all these lectures kind of in the DC area and understanding how how competitive, you know, the, 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 the McLean areas and the, and the Bethesda areas and the DC areas. But when we, we traveled outside of the country, we've been to, you know, 26 states or something like that. This is everywhere. And so we saw kids in second grade in Seattle in full school refusal, you know, fifth grade boys just undone by the pressure of doing well on, on their math, in their math class in school. And we thought, my goodness, if this is everywhere, it really can't be the, you know, this family or that school, you know, the, 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 there, there must be messages that are just kind of in the zeitgeist everywhere. And so we really spent some time thinking about well, what, what exactly is going on. And it seems to me through one thing is that the kind of drip feed message of kind of be very afraid, right? The world is really scary. And, and this was, to be honest, we wrote this before COVID. So, so we, can, we can set that aside for now. But, but how is it that we, you know, adults and we, we parents communicate messages of being very afraid? And some of this is through constant, some of it's through our language, we'll talk about in a minute. And some of it's through constant checking of tracking devices over and over and over. You know, what's the grade up to the second? Where's the kids? The kids two minutes late, I, you know, to school. And I could see that on Life360. And I understand why parents do that, wanting to make sure that their kids are safe. But it does convey a message in an in unintentional way that the world's so scary that I, as your parent, need to know where you are and, and what everything's going on up to the minute, as opposed to, I don't need, need to know where you are. I'm confident that something happens that you're, you're going to be able to figure this out. Um, Certainly through our language, and we talk about um, the guy named John and John and Julie Gottman, who are these you know decades long experts on relationships, and they stumbled. They spent a lot of time looking at the language patterns of of successful versus unsuccessful relationships, and discovered that really to be effective, to have kind of a more upbeat, glass half full kind of relationship, we need to have a ratio of positive to negative words of something like five to one. Now, we actually looked at the scientific research on this, and it turns out that negative words are way more powerful than positive words. If you put a person in a functional MRI and you know, look at the brain and, and you just say the word no, it's this cascade of stress reactions going throughout the brain. So we just want to be very purposeful. You know, if we know that negative, if we know that positive words are less powerful, we just need more positive words. You know, saying things like, you know, things tend to work out pretty well, you know, or, or you're doing, you're doing well enough for now, you know, or, or, or th th this is challenging, but, but I'm, I'm confident this is going to work out all right. Um, because if we can do that, we're, we're, we're just bending the, the, how folks think about life and how they really experience life. Um, and then the other thing in terms of being a non-anxious presence, and we talk about this a lot in both books, are really practices that support ourselves. And I know it's the oldest trope of every parenting book of put on your own oxygen mask first, but there's a heck of a lot to that because all emotions are contagious. If we as parents can be more calm, that's uh, contagious as well. I mean, we, we discovered this calm is contagious is a mantra of the Navy SEALs. So they're probably onto something there. And I'll share really quickly, I won't go too deep into it. For anyone who saw Bill and me the last time we were there, I've sort of caught up with Bill's haircut. Um, I have a, 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 my 19 year old in the middle of summer was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And he's, a, you know, he's on a good path. We're confident we're, we're going to get out of the woods. But it's been a lot. I mean, this was not the way that our family planned to spend our summer. And my wife, some point, you know, probably a couple of weeks into this, she said, I've had like three people ask me, how are you so calm about this whole thing? And she looked at me, said, honest to goodness, I don't know that I'd be handling this if I hadn't learned to meditate. And, you know, med some people have tried meditate. It may, it may not be the thing for everyone, but I think everyone needs to have something. Because simply put, if, you, if, a, if a person or a system or a nervous system has more stress coming into it, then we can sort of throw off in a healthy way, bad things happen. 
if we as parents or as teachers can can get rid of more stress, you know, then we a lot more stress and, and kind of be, a, you know, a stress sponge, then we can help calm other people down, including our kids when things are not going well, and help them be able to think more clearly and solve problems for themselves, just like Bill was talking just a minute ago. <laughs> one, of my, one of my favorite examples of a not of a parent who's not a nine nations presence is these two teenage boys are walking and uh, one, you know, one says, God, I'm just so fed up with my dad. He's always on my back. He's always telling me to get those. He's always asking me about my homework. So always telling me to get those grades up. Last night, I couldn't take it anymore. I said, get that salary up. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, but in any case, so we also we also talk about um, in, in our new book, we, we talk about we, we revisit motivation from a communication point of view. And um, you know, our, our go-to um, guide for thinking about motivation is self-determination theory, which holds that to be intrinsically motivation, uh, a kid or an adult has to have three needs met for a sense of autonomy, a sense of competence, and a sense of relatedness. And in, in our culture, what we tend to em emphasize way too much is the competence piece, that achievement piece. And, and, and Ned and I were, were stunned in 2017, we read this report from the Robert Wood, Found Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that concluded that the four main causes of mental health problems in adolescents were poverty, trauma, discrimination, and excessive pressure to excel. And so we, we, we try, we, we, in our book, we, we talk about the wisdom of, of minimizing the extent to, to which we try to motivate kids through nagging, through fear, through guilt, anger, bribery, stuff that works, it may work a little bit in the short term, but it never works in the long run. And, and there's a story in the book about a kid who I, who I tested, I just retested him recently, but a few years ago, I tested him. He was in eighth grade at a Catholic school and is applying out to other Catholic, to the Catholic high schools. So the, the pressure to do well. And this kid had, had a language disorder and learning disabilities and ADHD and school is really hard for him. And I go to this meeting and, and, and the, the principals at school, and people are saying, he's, just, he's not working very hard and, and, and he just put, put, need to put in more effort. And the principal said, I've had two kind of come to Jesus talks with them about the need to, to get this together. So, because it's a four year decision where he's going to high school. And I, I love this principal. I said, respectfully, I, I think that the more, the more we tell him how important it is he turns us around, the less he's going to be able to do it because the major manifestation of anxiety is avoidance. And it's not like it's, it's not lost on him that if he does better, he'll have more options for high school. It's just that, that school is hard for him and he's really anxious about it. And if we make him even more anxious, he'll just avoid it more and more and more. And so the, 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 fortunately, they're, they're willing to kind of listen and, and, and to revise things. And what they started to say to him is, look, it's just not that big a deal. Where, where you go to high school, if you, if you came and, and, and said to me, my life was a wash because I didn't get into this, this high school, this, it's just not that big a deal. I'd love you to see it turn this around. I'd love you to develop the confidence, and, and, but, but it's just not that big a deal. And just taking the pressure off was really motivating for, for, for this kid. And we, we talk about... The, <laughs> the importance of kids working hard and playing hard. And in, in both ways, we, we, we talk about the research that suggests that, that it's really kids' passionate pursuit of their pastimes, whether, whether it's soccer or whether it's or their sports or whether it's art or music or dance or rock climbing or coding. It's that passionate engagement, that flow experience where they're completely involved, completely engaged, challenged, challenged but not highly stressed. That's what, what fuels that development of internal motivation. And so we want kids to work hard, but we also want kids, kids to, to play hard. And, and, and we want kids to let them know how much we value what, 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 what the stuff that really turns them on and let them know you're sculpting a brain that's going to be able to, 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 to work hard, even in stuff that, that, that you're that good at. Um, and, uh, we, we, so, and we also talk about the, the, the power of just making offhand comments in terms of motivating kids. And so, so with kids that, that I see when I test kids and I, I test kids for a living, that, that they don't, if, I, if I've heard that they don't really work that hard or they give up easily, whenever I see them committing effort on something and not giving up, I, I won't say it right away, but a couple, an hour later, I'll say, you know, when we were doing that thing like an hour ago, I noticed that, that you just wouldn't give up. I just, I, I just realized that you're a kid who, who will just stick with stuff until you figure it out. I love that about you. 
And I think that, that, that those kind of offhand comments and, and, and kind of one-off really stick with kids. It's the kind of thing we'll they'll remember um, 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 a long time later. And I know now I'd love to, you have a pretty good story about that. <laughs> but, but also I just want to mention that we're going to transition to, because when, when, when parents often ask me and ask Ned, how do I motivate my kid? What they're really saying in some ways is how do I get my kid to change? Right. And, right. and so we, we have a chapter in the book on, on, on the, we call it the, the language and the silence of change. And you know, how do we help kids change? And Ned, talk, talk about that and start with that story though. About, yeah, so this, uh, was, this was just a lovely kid I worked with a long time ago. And she had an older sister who was very classically academic in ways that this child found harder to do. And she was, you know, wanting to work hard, but also kind of worried about what if I don't measure up? And so we're doing, you know, some dreary SAT prep and she, there's some passage and she gets a question right that was pretty hard. It was, it was would have typically hard for her, but honestly kind of hard for everyone. And I looked at her, she, I'm looking at her as she does her work. I'm like, huh? And, her, and she picks her head up. She said, what? And I said, well, that was kind of geeky. And she said, what? I said, well, mo most people don't get that right. That was, that, wow, that was cool. And, and nothing more. And she kind of looks at me a little quizzically and then kind of smiles and puts her head back down and keeps doing the work. So she eventually goes on and gets a score that's great for her and gets, go, go, applies to college and gets into college she's really excited about. And she kept coming back over and over. Every, every time she had a break, she'd pop her head in just to say hi. And then eventually I got a, she sent me a, a card for the holidays. You know, dear Ned, thanks. I'm loving, you know, this college and uh, this, doing this, doing that. You know, thank you so much for helping me get the scores because I don't think I'd be here without those. And thanks for making me a geek. And it was so, to Bill's point, it was so interesting because I could have gone a long lecture how you're just as active to make your kid and da, da, da. And, and I have a feeling she would have found reasons not to believe that where these offhand things, and, and this is often what we get to do when we're the grandparents or the tutor or the aunt or their uncle, then you just kind of put a little idea in kids' head and then they, and then they choose to run with this. Because as Bill was saying, you know, the, the language and the silence of change, and sometimes it's what we say and sometimes it's how we say and sometimes it's what we, what we don't say. Um, so basically it's important for us to remind ourselves that we can't change people who don't want to change, but we do everything we can to help them or, or when they do and to kind of create the space to make change possible. So we stumbled on, Bill stumbled on the research of, of what's called motivational interviewing. And this is a couple of psychologists who working with problem drinkers in the eighties. And classically, you know, with working problem drinkers, you, you give all the umpteenth reason that if you don't stop drinking, you're gonna lose your house, you're gonna lose your job, you're gonna lose your wife, you're gonna lose blah, 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 on and on and on and on. Like, like, like one more reason of terrible thing that would happen would be what would finally motivate me to drink less, but it didn't happen, right? It makes people more defensive, they're resistant, they don't wanna to listen to reason, they, 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 you, you create conflict and we lose that close connection that Bill was talking about at the beginning. And motivational interviewing is based on two, um, two great insights. One is that we have a writing reflex, meaning if someone brings a problem to us, particularly someone we really care about, we have as, 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 as caring families, as, as mammals, right? We have this inclination to want to fix it, right? To start giving advice or, or to tell them it's not such a big thing, like I was kind of talking about if a kid is poorly on a test. And the other insight is that people are ambivalent about change. So if I'm a problem drinker, if I'm a kid who's not doing well in school, it's not lost on me. You know, the Bill story, you know, if that kid worked harder and he got better grades, they didn't have more choices for high school, blah, his parents would be happy, everyone feel better, yada, yada. But he also knows that <laughs> I'd have to play less, you know, Xbox, right? I'd have less time with my friends. I'd have to do this work that I really think is kind of boring and maybe pointless. And that I could work as hard as I possibly can and really try to stick with it and still come up short. And then where would I be? So at least this way, if I dial in half effort and get half grades, I can, I can protect my own ego. So what motivational interviewing does is we recognize that ambivalence. We use empathy and validation. We ask open-ended questions and we listen for change talk. So empathy, validation, open-ended questions, listen for change talk. So here's the story that's in the book. So we have a, a, a dear friend who's a school counselor and she caught wind of a girl who was smoking way too much pot. 
So she finds a way to have a conversation with this girl and says, look, I'm not going to be the umpteenth adult that's going to tell you all the reasons why pot may not be such a good idea because you're a smart kid and, I, and I, I'm sure you understand that. She's taken force off the table. She said, I'm interested though. I'd, I'd love to understand your relationship with pot. Again, empathy, you know, and, and so the girl starts saying, well, she says, you know, I kind of like it when I'm high. You know, I'm not as stressed. Um, I really like the kids I hang out with. They're, they're really funny. I think I feel funny when I'm with them. Um, and she says, well, that makes sense. Empathy and validation. Keep going. Eventually, the girl sa says, um, it is kind of expensive, though. And our, that's where a typical parent would jump and say, yeah, but oh, so there's your reason. She says, oh, well, tell me more about that. Again, more questions. She says, well, if you, if you had more, she said, well, it's kind of expensive. I, I, I buy a couple times a week and it kind of uses all the money I have. Okay. If you had more money, what would you do with it? Well, my, my friend has these really neat pair of shoes. I'd really like to get a pair of those. And I'd probably get my hair done. I haven't done it. For, had my hair cut for a long while. Oh, that makes, that makes sense to me. And they keep talking and, and the kind of girl goes off and she says nothing more, very light. And she had created that opportunity for the change talk. She sees her a couple of weeks later and the girl hires her hair done. She says, oh, oh, well, tell me about that. She said, oh, well, oh yeah. Well, last week I decided to, to smoke a little. So I only bought once and I got my hair done. Do, do you like it? She said, yeah, I do. I think it looks great. And the idea behind this is that when people are stuck, we, it, we want to get them unstuck, but oftentimes they'll, they'll dig in deeper. And this change talk is based on the idea that it is so much more powerful for a person to articulate for themselves the reasons to change than it is for someone else to try to give them the reasons. And there's, and it's, it's a very, you know, it's a specific form of therapy that people get actual training in. But I think the lessons of it are ones that we believe that the lessons are ones that all of us can use, that we empathize, we express validation, we ask open-ended questions, and we try to create with very low energy and probably more silence than talk, the opportunity for kids to articulate for themselves why it might make sense to study a little harder, or work a little more, or smoke a little less. That's it. And, and you know, and it's clearly, it's, it's probably easier for, for a counselor to, to do that than it is for a parent. But I, 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 was, I tested a kid a couple of summers ago. We were just, I was reading about motivational intervening. We had the draft version of this chapter. And the, the, her 15-year-old is smoking a lot of pot. And I, and I sent her the, 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 draft, the draft version. And she just says, I, I really, I, I, I just, I, I try to get myself not to get on him about it and pounce on him about it and lecture him about it. I just showed, I tried to understand. I just tried to understand. And what happened is he said, yeah, it's really screwed up my basketball practice. And he stopped. And, and it, it doesn't, this won't happen in every case, but this is, this is a powerful tool. And we just love this idea that we have so much power to help people change if we don't try to change them. And Ned, what, what time do you have to jump? I'm gonna jump in six minutes. Okay. Um, well, let me let me just say this very. I'll take two minutes and just say that we also talk about something uh, in this chapter on change. It's it's called the Space Program. It's an it's an acronym for Supportive Parenting of Anxious Childhood Emotions. It's it, it's out of Yale, and it's a program for treating anxiety in children and adolescents that only works with the parents. And the idea is, as Ned said, because we're mammals, we're wired to soothe our young and protect them. And what we do is, when our, if our kids are anxious, is we make a combination. So a kid, a kid who is anxious will, will ask for a reassurance, and we can reassure a kid 20 times a day or 20 times before they go to bed. Or we'll stand with them at the bus stop, even though there's no other parents there because the kid's anxious. We, we accommodate in this way. And it turns out that accommodations make kids less anxious in the moment, but they make them more anxious over time. So this, the, this space program is based on the idea, same idea, if you try to intentionally change people, all you get is resistance and conflict. And so we don't try to change kids, but we change the way that we react. And, and what, what the space program asks us to do is to increase our supportive statements, which when our kids are anxious, which is, I know that this makes you, I know that turning an assignment in, we could make some mistakes on it, makes you really anxious. And I used to think that, that, that it was right for me to proofread it five times so you wouldn't turn the mistake. Now I realize that you can handle anxiety. That, that, that I'm, and, and, and by doing that, it's not making me less anxious. I think it's actually making it worse. So I'm 100% confident. I know it makes you anxious. I'm 100% confident How are we gonna that, get you, it? that you can handle it. Um, and um, so, and then also, that we, we, we let kids know, 
I used to, I, I, I've been making this accommodation, but I'm not going to do it anymore because because it's not helping. It's making things worse. And it's just it's just a it's a beautiful program. And um, for kids who are, for those of you who are anxious kids, I, I definitely look it up. Uh, uh, Ellie, Ellie Leibowitz, E L I Leibowitz made it up, and uh, it's a brilliant program. There's a new just Google Leibowitz um, space. There's a brilliant new book about it. Uh, but it's just this idea that we that we, we focus on on, on ourselves on, on our own changing our own steps to help kids change. That. Yeah, and there are, I know there are a lot of therapists in the in the area. I've been, I've been watching some chatter who have been getting this training. So it's it's really you know it's really effective. I mean this this this, this to your point again, Bill. This treatment was as effective in lowering the stress of children as if the children themselves had 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 um, cognitive behavioral therapy. Right. Um, so the last point that I'm going to make, and I'm going to run away from you all, and, and uh, again, I'm, I'm, I apologize for my uh, for the hiccups at our end. We're really grateful for you all being with us. Um, there's a chapter in the book called The Hard Ones, Sleep and Technology, and I'm sure there'll be more questions after I part depart, so I'll leave the good doctor Stixer to handle those. But um, in the same way that we talk about thinking, the parents thinking about themselves as consultants with school and homework and college and all that kind of stuff, we think it applies really well to sleep and technology because we get many, many, many questions about how do I manage my kids' use of technology? How do I get them off phone? How do I, how do I, how do I? And what happens is the more that we do that, the more kids fight us. And there really, there are no winners in power struggles, particularly not long-term in part for, for two reasons. One, if we're honest, we really should think of it, it's not our job to manage our kids' use of technology, particularly once they get, get into teenage years and, and more so high school, but rather to work with them in a collaborative way to help them learn to manage themselves technology. Because you know everyone read those things in the Wall Street Journal. We know what we're up against, right? And it's not just kids, it's us as well. So we wanna be working with our kids, not on our kids, because in part because it's, it's more effective also because if you have teenagers, you're only a couple of years away before those kids, your love of your life, leave your household, go off to some far-flung college with a suitcase full of your money and all their digital devices. So you kind of want them to learn how to use those devices to not squander that suitcase full of money. So the story that's in the book is this. So my son, who is now, well, second year in college, will be their second semester, um, his sophomore year of high school, he had a day off of school and saw his sophomore year, Fortnite came through our household like a biblical plague. And he played and played it every chance he got and he loved it. So he's got a, on Thursday night, he's got Friday off of school. I asked him, so hey, hey Matthew, what are you doing? Any, any plans for a day off tomorrow? He smiles, he says, Fortnite. Great, I say, any other plans? I'll think about it. Okay, so I come home, I don't know, six o'clock on Friday afternoon, there's my kid still you know, blowing things up or whatever, still playing Fortnite, mind you, in his pajamas. I admit to being a little hot, like, really, dude? And But fortunately, Fortnite doesn't take forever. And he's an easygoing kid. I said, could you do me a favor and hurry up and, 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 and win, die? I don't really care. Because I remember we were going to go out for dinner for, for pizza. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So he, whatever he does. And, and good God, man, could you, can you get dressed? Oh, yeah, yeah. He gets dressed. We go out to dinner, I calm down, we have a lovely meal. I say nothing more that night. I say nothing on Saturday. I say nothing on Sunday until five o'clock on Sunday afternoon where if you have a teenage boy or have ever been when you re re recognize as the witching hour, when it occurs to you that, oh my gosh, all that stuff, tomorrow's tomorrow, that's Monday, oh, ah! and all this work and now they have to do it. Now he's really upset. I can't I'm such an idiot. I can't believe I wasted the whole day playing for it. Why did I do some of it? Damn. If ever there were parental, ha ha, I told you, so. why don't you? you know? But you know, we're in the middle of writing this book. So I didn't do that. Best for empathy I can. Oh, dude, I, I know what that feels like. You know, I'd feel pretty upset too if I felt like I, you know, I could have used some of Friday and today would be better. Um, what, uh, uh, but, but if, and let me ask you a question. Do you know roughly how many hours you spent playing Fortnite? maybe eight, 10? Was it fun? Oh, it was great. We won like four times and on and on he goes. Another question though, if you had to think about it, how many hours would have been enough to get your Fortnite fix? Mm, probably four or five. Got it, that makes sense. Last question, would it be helpful going forward if mom or I kind of helped you manage your technology? So you could play, you know, we work with you, but you don't feel like you wouldn't be in this position where you feel like you wasted all this time. Yeah, that'd be great. 
now we had perfect buy-in and we could offer and but not feel like we're on them all the time and it was very much a process but i'll tell you the kid went off to college he got an xbox second semester of his senior year because global pandemic virus that's the right time to get them right and and took this and his phone and everything off to college and he you know it's not like it was perfect it wasn't like there weren't late nights and things you know done at the last minute but goodness knows you know he did a great job in college and i'm absolutely convinced if we had managed done all command and control for those last two and a half years of high school his first two and a half years of college would have been a disaster because just as bill was talking about with these kids at the manager clinic you know, if, if children need as much opportunity to handle things for themselves, even when it's messy, with our advice, with our help, with our empathy, and, and with our guidance, but, but giving them, working with them, not on them, so that they can be prepared to leave our household and handle hard things by themselves with support, not our handling those things for them. Bill, it's your show. And Kathleen, thank you so much for having us again. I, I'm sorry to run away from folks, um, but I will uh, I will have a lovely time with my family and I will leave. Um, Bill has my proxy and everything he says is always true. So there's Thank that. you, Ned. And Bill and I, we connect, so we'll be able to handle it from now on. <laughs> have, a, have fun with your wife. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, all. Whoops, can't hear, can't hear you, Bill. Well, what I said is that let Ned if I have given hundreds of lectures about the self-driven child and, and also their new book, and, and I'm pretty good, at, I'd be pretty good if somebody asked a question knowing what Ned would say, so I can fill in there, but I'll just mention a couple more things uh, uh, that we talk about in our book, and they'll be happy to take questions. And I had a really experience uh, also in Texas. I, I was talking, I was in a, a really elite independent school in Texas. And I, and I lectured to, to, to parents in, in, in the morning and then again at night, talked to faculty. And at lunch, I had lunch with the, with, with the student government uh, kids. And at one point, I just asked them, how, do we, how many of you want to be happy as adults? And they all kind of sheepishly raised their hand like, duh. You know? and, and I said, what do you understand it takes to be happy as an adult? And this one kid, they all thought about this one kid said, well, we understand that if you get, if you get into a good enough college, everything else is set. And I go, oh my God, how, that, how could they be so wrong? And we, we knew that, you know, if that were true, you know, students at Yale and Princeton and Harvard would be the happiest people on the planet. And, and yet they're, they're probably among the most miserable. And, and we, were, we were pretty familiar with the work of Larry, Lori Santos, who, who is a psychology professor at Yale, who lived in, and maybe still live in, in, in these residential dormitories with, with, with undergraduates. I was struck with how unhappy they were and just how stressed and pressured. He said that they can't enjoy Yale and they're just so stressed and pressured and anxious. So she started teaching the course on the science of happiness and it quickly became by far the most popular course in the history of Yale University. And the idea is these kids are jumping all this if they got into Yale and they're miserable, they're desperate to know how do you feel, how, what, what, it take, what does it take to be happy? And so Ned and I, when we work on the book, we think, we're thinking, why don't we get an earlier start? Let's not wait till kids have to, are miserable in college to, to figure out, to let them know, here's what we understand about happiness. And in, our, in, in this chapter, we, we, we use the model from Martin Seligman, who um, actually founded the whole field of positive psychology that studies positive states like happiness. And uh, how do you get there? What are, what are happy people like? What do they do? What is, and and he uses the acronym PERMA to, to summarize what, 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 what contributes to happiness and it's positive emotion. And, and certainly there's some genetic limits on, on, on your, whether you're more upbeat or a little bit more morose, but there's a lot you can do with positive, to, to increase positive emotion. And, and then it's, it's engagement in that, that flow experience that makes life feel meaningful, that deep engagement, this is something where you're completely involved. It's relationships, it's pursuing things that are meaningful to you. And it's accomplishment. The A is, and it's not that accomplishment's not important. And people generally feel better if they feel like they're successful than if they feel like they're failing. But it's only part of the story. And actually the science suggests that it's a pretty, it may be 10% of the story of happiness, actually what happens to you. There's so, that, that so much is what we make out of it. And, and so what we talk about in the chapter is how do we talk to kids about relationships? And how do we model for them 
how important relationships are. You know, so sometimes Ned was talking to the parent who said, all my kid wants to do is, is play soccer and hang out with her friends. What's that going to get her? It's not, that's not, that's not going to get her to college. And we think that that's the wrong message. The message, we, we, want, we want kids to be as successful as they want to be, but we want them to be able to enjoy their success. And we see so many adults and, 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 and so many college students who are extremely successful, who just don't enjoy it. They just aren't happy. And, and we want kids to, get, to, to know that it's a relationship. That, that, as I said earlier, that the supporting that deep engagement and stuff that they really love. It's the relationship is the meaning and encouraging kids to think about, you know, if there's a reason you're on this planet, what do you think it might be? There's this research, there's a lot of research actually. You have high school kids about to take a test, write for five minutes about one of their highest values, and they're much less anxious and they do better on the test. And because when you think about your highest values, that test is just not that big a deal. And so it's, it's meaning, and then it, 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 we support achievement, of course, um, but we also talk in this chapter about the, the, the tendency to confuse happiness and, and, and pleasure. And the neurochemistry of pleasure, which is, tends to be kind of short-term, kind of rush kind of thing, is, is pretty different than, than the neurochemistry of, of happiness. And, and we think that, when, that part of the reason that kids in really high achieving schools are at much higher risk for substance use disorders in, in, into kind of the mid twenties at least, is that, is, is that they, they, they use chemicals and they, they, they seek things out as pleasure uh, to, to kind of deal with stress, is it's gonna offset stress, but it doesn't really lead to happiness. So, um, and, and we, for, for our point of view, we, 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 the way that we define successful life, it's a life you're happy with. And that's what we, we want kids to create a life that they're happy with. And the last thing I'll say before I take questions is that um, the last chapter in our book, it's, it's called, but what about consequences? And so often, because we, we talk about so much about kids, about autonomy and kids running their own life, well, parents say, what about consequences? And the idea is that we, we want kids to learn from their own experiences. And I mean, in fact, the, the, but the, the root of the word discipline is to teach. And that's what we're trying to do. We are trying to teach kids what works in this world and what doesn't. And we, we, Ned and I are big fans of, of natural consequences. You know, a kid forgets to, to bring his, his, his lunch and, and you, you don't bail him out. And he's more likely to, to, to uh, remember it the next day and uh, that kind of thing. And also collaborative problem solving. When problems come up, when you're in a good mood, your kid's in a good mood, you, you kind of bring up a problem, always starting with empathy. And you, you, kind of, his, you, you articulate his side and he will talk a little bit. You, you express your, your, your feelings and then you try to work out something that works for both of you. And both of our books, we, we, really, we really play up. We really love this idea of collaborative problem solving. And it turns out that punishment, you know, taking kids away, you're, you're grounded, you're no, no phone for you. It's just not very effective. It's, it's not very effective in the long run in, in teaching kids to really to learn from their experience. And we think that, that that's so often, that, that, that it's often the kids who get the most consequences who learn the least from them. And we see this in schools all the time because they have behavior problems. They have the same behavior plan for, for year after year, even though it doesn't seem to, to, to act, help at all. And we want to remember that the most important thing is our relationship with our kids. And there's a story that towards the end of the book. It's actually, we were just finishing the book and one of my, one of my childhood friends, I was just talking to him, uh, he told me the story, he said, you know, he has four kids and his younger kid was a real spitfire. And in high school was constantly challenging parents, constantly uh, breaking, breaking rules, testing limits, constantly lying about it. And one night the mom's out of town and my friend, the, the dad is at a meeting and he gets a call from a neighbor saying, you, you know, your, your daughter has about 20 friends over, they're all drinking in your house. And, and so when the meeting was over, he goes home and the kids have cleared out. And he, and he confronts his daughter and says, John called from across the street. And he said, you, you, your kids had a big drinking party here. He said, no, no, I didn't. That's not true. Are you saying that John lied? He must be, because that, that, that didn't happen. So he calls John again and he talks to John's wife, who's a, who's a therapist. And she said, Rob, and she hears a story about, about the, they, they took everything. It's the kind of thing, I've tried everything. I've taken everything away. We've grounded her. Nothing seems to work. She said, Rob, give her amnesty. Tell her whatever happened tonight didn't happen. So he goes to his, his daughter and, and, and says, you know, if I, was, if I was lying to my parents, kind of just straight face like this, I'd probably feel kind of guilty about it. So I'm not going to pile on. And I just want you to know 
that whatever happened tonight didn't happen. You have complete amnesty. And he went to bed. And she came into his room half an hour later and said, Dad, I was lying that we did have a party here tonight. And I'm really sorry I lied to you. And he said the temperature in our house went up 30 degrees because this was the first open, honest, sincere conversation they'd had in a couple of years. And he said it was really the turning point that they, they had, when that shifted, the girl started to, to talk a little bit more about what she considered to be the negative influence some of her friends were having. She changed her friend group. Um, and and, and it, 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 they, they developed a really close relationship. They still have a very close relationship. This is the turning point it was, not, it was, was getting out of the idea that everything has to have a consequence, I, that you got to pay for what you did, to, to, to really to, to mean remembering that relationship. It's the closest thing to a silver bullet for protecting kids. And I'll stop there. And, and Kathleen, we, we can take questions. Okay, I have opened up the chat window. So we'll give everyone a few minutes to go ahead and type questions. Um, if you have any questions for Dr. Sticksrud. I'd love your input too, Kathleen, as somebody who <laughs> <laughs> works in high school. And... I wrote down a lot of notes. So okay, if anyone okay. has a question, I'm sure I can think of something. <laughs> did, did you show them your tabbed copy of the book? Yes. <laughs> oh, <yeah>. <laughs> okay, well, while we're waiting, I do have a question. You had a quote where you said you want parents should, oh, wait, we, we have a couple of questions. So I'll wait until the end if, if there's yeah. more time. Okay, autonomy, confidence, what was third? Okay, so this is self-determination theory and it, it, it's, it's the, the, the most elegant theory of intrinsic motivation. And it's been around for 30 years and, and it's so simple and, and so beautiful. It just, just guides our thinking about how do we help our kids be motivated. And so it's, it's, it's relatedness. It said that the kids, kids will work harder for a teacher that they like or they respect than a teacher they don't. And, and they're more likely to go along with us and more likely to, to really stay motivated if, they ever, if we have a positive relation with them. So it's relatedness, it's autonomy. And autonomy, as we emphasize in our first book, autonomy is probably the most important thing. And the third is, is competence, K -O -C -O -M -P, competence, not, not competence. It's that, that's that you don't want to work very hard at stuff you don't, if you feel like terrible at it. So it's that supporting competence. And that, that, that's the thing that, 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 that I think we overemphasize is that, that achievement, that competence piece, often at the expense of relatedness and, and, and promoting autonomy. We actually talk about that a lot as a staff at McLean High School, how we put achievement so much higher than belonging or relatedness, mm. which is very similar. And yes. children okay. and students need to feel like they belong at home and that they belong at school before they're going to be able to achieve. You know, I, 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 Kathleen, I gave, I gave a talk uh, a few years ago um, in New York for, um, on the adolescent brain, and I had about 150 educators in, in the audience, and all, all of whom taught middle school and high school. And I said, what's the key to, 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 uh, to teaching adolescents? And this one said, this one teacher said, it's the three R's of teaching, relationship, relationship, relationship. You know, it's really, it's really the, the three hours of parenting, you can say. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Okay, our next question. Can you talk a little bit more about how parents can manage their frustration while attempting to provide empathy and support to their child? Yeah, you know, and this, this is a hard time. And, um, and certainly many parents in the pandemic were reporting kind of empathy burnout, you know, the, 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 and, uh, and so I, I think that it has to do largely you know, with taking care of ourselves. And I think that the frustrations, the tools that we talk about in our book include, I mean, the, the, the basic things that allow your brain to keep things in perspective um, and the, the meditation, the exercise, the sleep, that, that, means that, 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 that your frustration tolerance is so much higher when you're well rested and you aren't stressed. And so it's that, and also we talk about a, a, a practice of what we call radical acceptance. And, and the idea that, that most of our frustration, most of our anxiety is based on the idea that so, somehow things, are, sh things right now should be different than they are. And my kid should be different than, than he is. She should be different than, than, than she, she, she should be doing differently than she is. 
And actually, there, there's no evidence that that's true. It's, it's not like it's written someplace that, that, that things are supposed to be different. And a practice like that can, can also help us kind of avoid the frustration to thinking, oh my God, this is, this, this, this is something terrible happening. And, and in the first book, you know, we, we talked about that, that Chinese parable where the, the idea is that everything that happens, it looks like it's bad, but this man, the Chinese man says, well, y- yes, well, y- maybe yes, maybe no. And it turned out that everything that seemed to be bad led to something good. And so we talk about kind of that, 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 that perspective of realizing that we don't always know what's, what's best. That often what seems like a disaster turns out to be the best thing that could happen. I, I, the first time, my first experience in graduate school, I, I was in the doctoral program in English at, the, at Berkeley. And I, and I went for 20 straight weeks without turning in an assignment because I was so anxious and insecure, I didn't turn anything in. So I flunked out and I felt my whole life was going up in smoke. I've never been more humiliated and, and so embarrassing. And it took me about a month to realize that I, I always felt like an imposter with other literature students. And, and that is the best thing that could have ever happened to me was, was getting out of the English program. And luckily I, I stumbled on psychology. So the, the, it, it's, it's how we frame things and it's the practices that allow our nervous system to keep things in perspective. And, do, do, Kathleen, do you want to add? Oh, um... I think, you know, one of the hardest parts is just how much we care about our kids and how hard it is to see what we think is that that they're making a mistake. We can see, we think that this is such a big mistake, but you're right that we don't know. We can't predict the future. We don't know what's going to come out of this. So just kind of taking a step back, taking some deep breaths, taking some time for ourselves and realizing that our problems, I like how you say too, whose problem is this? right? Asking whose problem really is this? Is this my child's problem or is this my problem? It's my child's problem. You know, I, I, I did this exercise some years ago with, with, with a, 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 at a school with, with, with a, a parent educator. And we made up these scenarios and you know, a third grade girl who, who's the only, girl, the only kid in her friend group who didn't get invited to a birthday party or 15 year old boy comes home and he's got cut from the basketball team or his girlfriend just dumped him. And the first question we ask parents to ask themselves is whose problem is it? Because, because we're wired, as we're, we're wired to, to, to jump in and solve it for them. And, and, and not doing that is, 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 really, <laughs> is really useful. Uh, yes, okay, so we have another question first. Melissa says, thank you so much for your wisdom. Do you have any advice on school refusal? Yeah, I, I think that, um, <clears throat> that school refusal is, is really, during the pandemic, it is uh, it was still in office, but, but the, 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 the uh, Lockdown. I mean, it was, it was so so many kids. We you know, wouldn't turn on their camera and this and that. And I I I, th- I think that um, that there, there there's a therapy group in in, in the DC in Greater DC area. Uh, John Dalton's group specializes in, in school refusal. And I think that the the keys really are trying to ideally you get kids back in school soon. And you work with Kathleen and you work with with, with the people in the school who really know how to make the kid feel safe. And it, it's, it's an anxiety related problem. Again, the, the major manifestation of anxiety is you avoid um, stuff. So I, I, I think finding a professional who has a lot of experience managing school refusal and is really good at working with school and with parents to, 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 to help kids um, to figure out um, whether, what the kind of, to figure out how to safely get back to school. And it's interesting, when Ned and I were working on uh, the proposal for the self-driven child before we ever had a contract, we worked with this this writer who who knew how to write proposals. And her own kid, as we were working, we met together every week, and her own kid was like, I think it was 14, was in full-on school refusal. And then they moved, they moved to Europe. And he's continued, and and eventually, and and she she talked to us, and and we'd say, look, this doesn't have to be solved immediately. It, it's it's not like he's he's gonna this this means he's gonna never show up to, to work and never go out of the house. All of all of our fear, all of our anxiety about our kids, it's about the, the it's it's based in the future. It's based on the idea that somehow they're gonna get stuck in some negative place and it's never gonna get better. And 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 so I I think that um, part of it is is keeping perspective. And we we're just we we just our role with 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 this woman that we worked with was just helping her to just kind of stay, not panic about it. And it turned out that the kid was really into music. And, and so he, he went back for the music period. And then they got, it started to feel safe there. They branched out. And we just, just heard from her recently. They just graduated from high school. He's in college now. 
Um, and, and generally, if we don't get stuck and we don't panic, and we, we, we say, okay, we'll, we'll figure this out, we'll find some, but we don't panic. The kids go through stuff and they get out of stuff. I just talked to a mom today of a, a kid who was in sixth grade, basically almost flunked sixth grade. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm preaching this self-driven child line to her of, of, of consulting not, not, and, and reporting the relationship. And, and she, I talked to her today and she said, he's completely turned it around. She said, it's, 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 they just got straight A's in eighth grade. And this kind of thing happens all the time. And so uh, do you want to add anything about school refusal? No, I, I agree with everything you said and definitely talk with your school psychologist, school social worker, school counselor. We're all here to help with those situations and definitely getting the student in school as much as possible. Don't ever let them stay home. Call us. We'll get them there. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank There's, you. Oh, I am curious about consequences. When what consequences work and what do not for teens? How do you teach natural consequences while having a teen understand there are also parental expectations? So, well, I'll, I'll have to mention I, I didn't I didn't uh, I didn't have time to talk about. It. We actually have a, a chapter in the book on parental expectations, and, and the, the chapter is called "What if I don't want to live up to my potential? What if I don't want to live up to my potential?" <laughs> which I actually had a kid say to me once, and uh, there, there's a lot of kids who really wear the potential like a hundred pound weight. Uh, and, uh, but in any case, um, I think it, the, our, our take on consequences is this, that the natural consequences are things that we don't have to do anything, that life, life just takes care of. It. I mean, I, um, you know, th that there's a story in our first book about this kid I tested probably 30 years ago and who had flunked all his classes. He was at, at, at um, at uh, BCC in Bethesda. And he, um, he flunked all of his classes in ninth grade. He flunked all of his classes in the first semester of 10th grade. And the, the, the parents, and, I, I, and I, that 30 years, I, I thought this exactly, as I wrote some stuff 30 years ago, I was just looking at it, 34 years ago, actually. Uh, that is exactly like what we, what's in the stuff different child. And so I, I was talking, I said, we got to change the energy that the adults, this kid had two tutors and a therapist, and the adults were spending 90 units of energy, 90 units of energy, trying to get the kid to work. He wouldn't do anything. And, and what happened was, is I, I said, we got to change this energy. But what happened was that uh, after the second semester of 10th grade, he met with the school counselor and said, you know, honey, you know, we're going to have to plan an extra year of high school for you. And it's the first time that he realized I'm not going to graduate with my friends. And the parent is inside the parent, the parents didn't do anything. The, the counselor wasn't trying to be punitive. The counselor liked him. He's a nice kid. But he said, just, just the reality is that you didn't you, you didn't pass any classes. So you need more time. This kid, honest to God, he started going to day school and night school. He graduated on time, went right to college, and majored in psychology. Um, and, and so uh, I, I think that, that we know that punishment is just not effect, it's just not an effective tool, and what's much more effective. Is, is, is talking with kids and trying to establish limits. I mean, to try to, what, 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 what are the rules of the family, what chores, expectations. And, I, and also we can establish, well, if, if you don't do your job, what, what do you think would be a right kind of consequence? And if I don't do my job, you know, what, what do you think? You, you talk that stuff through so that, that it's agreed upon and, and, and it's rational. And it makes sense. And it's just not impulsively saying, well, no, you know, I'm, I'm, no phone for you for two weeks, that, that kind of thing. Um, and I th think that ideally, you know, the consequences could happen without a lot of anger in our part, without a lot of scolding, without lecturing, that they're worked on in advance. Um, but we use this collaborative problem solving. Uh, it's, it's so much more powerful than, than taking stuff away or grounding kids. And I'm not saying you know, if, if, if a kid has if people over drinking, you find out that, that ideally you start, you, you seek to understand. You, we, we, ideally we always seek to understand, but then we can kind of, we can work it out with them. Well, well you know, no, um, that, that, that's, I, I, you don't go to a party for the next couple of weeks. I just want you to reflect on this. I mean, there, there's stuff like that, um, but they seem that kind of, that they're, that's a rational response. Uh, you want to add in, Kathleen? Oh, that's, it's a hard one, definitely the natural consequences. Um, but I think one of the keys, I, I agree with everything you said, and also trying to have those conversations with your teenager when you're calm, 
yeah. calm moment when you're not upset about something going wrong, like take a couple days, sit down and try to discuss it rationally, like ask them how they feel, ask them about their feelings, ask them how they think they can solve the problem. And that, that will work better if you're both in a calm frame of mind. Yeah, yeah. Okay, when you see your child leave the house to see a friend, when he has a major test tomorrow to make up, who could this be? This is one of my parents. <laughs> 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 what do you do? This just happened. So I guess her son just left and he has a major test to make up tomorrow. What should she do? Okay. Yeah. Um, from, from, we actually, there's a story in our book about a very similar situation here. And so um, we, we should remember whose problem is it? And and because again, if the kid, if the kid wants to do well, I mean, we we can't make kids want to do better than than they than they want. We can't make them want what they don't want. But if the kid presumably doesn't want to fail his tests and goes out and 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 and, and fools around rather than studying. He'll experience it. He won't do as well as he wants to do. And if we don't, if we don't say, well, I told you so, if we don't do that. We use empathy if he's so frustrated. And we don't have, it teaches itself. The kid will, the kid will tell him, he's just much more likely to tell him, geez, I, I really made a bad decision. And then you say, well, <laughs> I'm an expert at making bad decisions. I've made a lot of bad decisions all my life. You know, it's part of life and you learn from it and you grow from it. That's no big deal. And, um, as opposed to we, we don't what, what what I I'm much more humble now than, than than I was when I was younger about knowing what's in kids' best interests, and I and I just because I I don't know what's right for them and, and for for me I, I I flunked I flunked English the the, the 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 second quarter of my senior year in high school I got an F was the only F I ever got uh, but, but it kind of woke me up. And uh, my father is dying of cancer, which I've had some reasons, but I actually, for the first time, I actually got some extra reading. I, did, I, didn't, want, I didn't want to flunk, so I got, got some extra reading. And, I, and the first time I really enjoyed this, some, some reading and writing, writing some stuff about it. But I majored in English, actually, in college. and we went to graduate school in English <laughs> until I flunked out. Uh, but but, but my, my point is simply that so often, it's experiences like that that teach themselves, that, that teach kids the, the lesson about life. Boy, I, I, I made a bad judgment there. And from my point of view, that's much more important than how the kid does on this test or that test or that test. It's hard to watch as a parent, and this is where the radical acceptance comes in, right? Where I can't understand how you wouldn't care about this test, but he does care. He just doesn't understand what he needs to do to be successful. So he, it, it's very torturous and it takes a long time for them to learn but he will learn. It's just gonna be a little bit very hard for you as a mom to watch, but try to get that radical acceptance and know that this is his problem and his yeah. choice. And I know in our first book, similar situation, and Ned's advice is, it was, and parents say, it's so hard to watch, what should I do? And Ned says, don't watch. <laughs> Love it. Okay, next question. Um, our daughter always says she does not have mo does not have motivation to study, though she cares about her grade. She spends a lot of time on games. Is there any suggestion? Again, for I mean, there are kids who have really serious. You know, there some percentage of the population. It's it's not. It's pretty small. It's less than ten percent, probably about ten percent have kind of an addictive relationship with games. And, and I think that th th those kids need treatment. But I, I think that what we talked about in their book is, 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 um, is again, th that showing interest. Sh sh to try, because so, so many of the parents that they, they work with who, who aren't big gamers themselves, they, they, they don't really, they, they kind of, now just wasting time, just wasting time doing that. And it's hard to, it's hard to really to, to respectfully engage with kids and help them figure out how to set limits on their, on, on their gaming themselves if, if we don't know what they're doing. And so what we recommend is play games with them. Have them show you, so sit, and watch, let, let, sit and watch them and, and say stuff like, God, I never realized how, 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 how social this is. I never realized how, how, how good you feel when, when, you, when, you, when you win a game or move up the next level. I, I can see what, why you like this so much. And then it was, we're just in a much better position then to, to, to later say, 
you know, I, I, I love I love how much you enjoyed this game. But I also I, I worry a little bit that you're spending so much time on it. And it's, it's a fact, I know you want to do well, you, you want to do well in school. And I'm just a little concerned that, that you're spending so much time in game that you can't do as well as you want. Am I, is, is, that a, is, that a, is that something that you think we, we should try to talk about a little bit? Would you, would you try to shift that a little bit? Have that kind of conversation with you because ultimately um, it, it, it's, she's gonna to need to figure out uh, how to do that? How, how to manage her, her games, and how to how to figure how, how to how to align her energy with her motivation? And what what what, what I tell kids is is uh, I, from time to probably about eleven or so, as I said in two thousand eighteen, um, two hundred psychologists signed a letter addressed to the to the president of the American Psychological Association, asking them to censure psychologists working in Silicon Valley knowingly using motivational and behavioral techniques to make these products that kids use as addictive as possible. And they, they had to let, really let them know what they're up against. And then I, I know several teenagers who watched that, that, that Netflix documentary, Social Media, and, and they, they realize how much they're being played and manipulated by, by, through social media, who just deleted their TikTok account or this or that. So I, it really is this, this, this problem solving, this consulting, this supervision, and, and unless they really, have what looks like an addictive relationship and they really need treatment. I will I will jump in here and say that my son <coughs> had a gaming problem when he was a freshman in high school. And um, we argued so much about it that he we I took him to see a therapist and let the therapist work out the limits with us. It helped a lot. So if you're arguing and you see this as a problem that's continuing for any issue that you have with your child or that you feel like your child is having. I'm a big fan of therapy. Um, my kids have been a couple times each throughout their lives. I've been a, at least three times throughout my life. It's always helpful and it, and it helped us get through his freshman year of high school because it was a rough year for us. Yeah, no. I also, I mean, I, I haven't done therapy in about 20 years myself, but, but I, I'm also a big fan. Um, okay. How do you work with your child on technology limits if they refuse to admit or see the negative consequences or negative effects of the excessive use? You know, I, I think that um, the, the way we think about it is that, um, is that ideally, when kids start using technology, when we let, when we let them have a phone, we, we, we let them you know, get, get their first video games, is with the understanding so some kind of understanding, and, and some people write contracts about what, what, what the expectations are. And, and um, so I, I think in a situation like, like this, where kids have the technology and, and they're using it excessively, um, and there's, there's no kind of perfect answer, but, but I, I think that if, if your sense is that, that, it's really, um, that it's really interfering with their life, what we want to do is when, when you're in a good mood, kids in a good mood, say, you know, I, I know how much you, you start with empathy. I, I know how much you love this stuff. And, I, and, and, and it looks to me like, like other parts of your life are sucking here because you're spending too much time on it. And that's my concern. And if the kid says, no, I don't think so, then, then we say, Let, let's study it for a little bit. How, how, would we, how would we know whether you're right or I'm right? And then let's, let's think of what, so we think whatever it is, whether it's his school performance or his, his, his relationship with his friends, let, let's see, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you can play this much and still do as well as you, as you want. So we, ideally we would figure out some way to study it that we, we can, so again, it's, it's not feeling that we have to change this immediately. Um, and if kids are using it excessively, I completely agree with, 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 with Kathleen. But let, get, get a third party involved. Get, get a therapist involved and uh, who um, a lot of times kids will listen to, to messages um, from other people they don't, <laughs> they don't take from their parents. And also, I just want to mention that fighting about, one of the things we say in the book is that fighting about the same thing over and over again is always toxic. It's always in any kind of relationship. Um, and, and so we, that we find ourselves doing that. Uh, then we want to say you know, that you know I don't want to fight about this all the time. You know that, that uh, the, the, our line from the first book: "I love you too much to fight with you about this." And then th th there are kids where, where it, I, I, I counseled parents the other night, 
where th- th- this kid is on his phone w- w- way too much, and, and and they're paying the kids, they're, they're paying the kid's phone, they're paying his charges. I, I said, this is, this is, say, look, I, I love how much you love this, and also I, I have feeling like I'm not feeling right as a parent, and I because I'm paying for this stuff. So if you want to get a job, and 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 and, and kind of get to, to be able to pay for your minutes, and, and, and that that's okay with me. But I, I I can't pay for for, for your, your phone usage if, if I feel like you're using it too much. So, so that we, we got to have some kind of negotiation. Thanks, Bill. I I'm noticing we have a lot more questions, and the presentation was supposed to end at eight o'clock, but I know that you're you're willing to go a little bit later, right, Bill? We had talked about this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, when people want to leave, they can leave. If they want to stay, they can stay. We're going to go through at least a few more questions and see how that goes. Um, Thank you for this presentation. Most of this advice is geared toward our adolescent children, which I appreciate. What is your best advice for preparing young middle and elementary schoolers for the stress of high school and the college admittance process? In other words, how can they be coached from a younger age to be ready for these pressures? Well... (laughs) My own feeling about this, and I think Ned, Ned shares this, is that the, the way that we, the, the way that kids up grow, grow up thinking about college, is delusional, in the sense that the, the, they they have the idea. I mean, mo, so many of the kids that, that, that we work with, and, and, and I will say many of their parents have the idea that the most important outcome of their whole childhood and adolescence is where they go to college. And we think that it's just, it's just so wrong. It's so much, who you marry is so much more important than, than, than where you go to college. And I think that, that as a proud University of Washington Husky who graduated from high school with a 2.8 grade point average, it's hard for me to take seriously the tragedy of a kid not getting into a top 10 college. And there's so many colleges and so many ways to go to get good, good education. And I think that we can help, we can really help kids deal with the pressure by really cl- being really clear in ourselves that w- where they go to college is, is not that big a deal. We want them to get a good education, but where they go to college isn't that big a deal. So that we just, we just don't, we, we don't put pressure on them themselves. We, we, and and when, I, when I see kids who, who, who are really discouraged, I, said, I see a lot, I, I test a lot of underachieving high school kids. And, 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 and what, I, what I tell them, is that you can flunk every single one of your high school classes. And if you decide that was a bad idea, I want to get an education, you can go to Nova for, th- for two semesters and 30 credits, and then you can apply to most of the colleges in this country, and they don't want to see your high school transcript. And what, what happens when I tell them that is it motivates them because then they can see a path. They can see a path. Well, if I can't get it together soon, I can see a path. So I'm just saying that I, I think one of the ways that we can help them most is, is letting them know that we, we want you to get a good education. We want you to work hard in school. Watch, what I told my own kids was that there's a very low correlation between your grades and your and success in life. And what I really care about is that you develop yourself so that you have something useful to offer this world. And, and the parole officers there, they're doing great. And they're, as I made that up, but, but, um, but um, I, I think that we can help them primarily by not buying in to this, what, what we consider to be shared delusion about the idea that the, where you go to college is the be all and end all in terms of happiness. You look at the level of misery in, 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 in elite colleges, it's just off the charts. Let's, get, let's, let's get, talk to kids about happiness. Let, let, let's, let's put the college admissions into perspective. Achievement, again, it's part of the, it's part of the formula, but it's only one fifth of the formula. I could talk for a long time about this. Um, I'll just say a couple things. There are over 4,000 colleges and universities in this country, and there's an obsession with about 100 of them. Yeah. And it is causing massive anxiety, massive depression, massive pressure and stress. It's causing our kids to be unhappy. Um, let your child be as successful as they want to be. Let them do what they want to do. Let them explore their interests when they're in elementary and middle school and everything will work out. The most important thing is that they have jobs around the house, that they know how to make friendships, that they, they, their parent, they have a good relationship with their parents. If they have all those things, everything will be fine. They will go to college. There's so many colleges to go to, but if we 
think about only these 100 schools that are very hard to get into, and there is a lot of pressure. We don't have to buy into that. So let's expand our view of what success means, and let's expand our view of what acceptable colleges are for our children. And don't Beautiful. buy into it. Beautiful. <laughs> so when my daughter was in high school, she, she just turned 40. When she was in high school, uh, and she came to a lecture that I gave on the on the adolescent brain, and we're and, and I I just basically gave the same kind of speech I, that I just gave, and she's 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 riding home, and she says she, she says I bet you don't really believe that, and I said I, I completely believe that, and she says everybody else says that that that, 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 that most of my grades and you got got into the best possible school, and I said and, and I said well I'll tell you what I'll offer you a hundred bucks for a C because I just want you to have the experience that that getting a C it's just not that big a deal. And she, she never took me up on it and got a PhD, PhD in economics from the University of Chicago. But, but, um, but I just wanted to let her know that, that and, and my saying that to her, it didn't discourage her. That it, see, that that's the thing, that, that, that we want kids, kids that want to go to elite colleges. Great, let them go for it. But let's not give them the message that it's necessary. Because what makes you crazy is the idea of telling you just, I have to do this. You need to do this. That's what makes, that parental expectations, as I, in, in the book, we talk about the research on parent, parent expectations. And parent expectations are extremely, pot, they're extremely highly correlated with kids' achievement. But it's not, I expect you to, you need to do this. I'll be disappointed if you don't. It's, I have confidence that you can. Um, All right. Okay. And talking about technology, is there a guideline for what addiction looks like? I feel like COVID has really drawn many kids in because they relied a lot on technology for entertainment, social life. And now many of them are having trouble getting back to even maintaining minimal academic responsibilities. Is there a guideline on when when parents should consider seeking professional help? Yeah. Uh, In in the book, there's a guy, um, there's a psychiatrist uh, in in this area, he's in DC. Uh, There's there's a psychologist in Bethesda by the name of Ed Spector, who um, specialized in this area. There's a psychiatrist who all he does is is game addiction. Um, And I'm just blanking, his his name is Cliff Sussman, Cliff Cliff Sussman. And I I go on Cliff's website, because there's stuff on his website about what, what are the signs. And you know, they're like most addictions where, where kids lie about it. They, 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 they way uh, underestimate how much time they're using. They, they, may, um, they may steal to, to, to get money. They, 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 uh, they can't think about anything else. But there, there's things, and, and it's, it's not everybody's equally vulnerable. Kids who tend to have weakness in impulse control, kids who are socially vulnerable, more likely. But I, I go, go on Cliff's, Cliff Sussman, S-U-S-S-M-A-N, his website, because he has a lot of good stuff on, on kind of how, how do you assess whether this is healthy use of technology or excess. Did you have other resources, uh, Kathleen? No, I think that was a great answer. Thank you. Um, next question is, how do you improve your t- relationship with your teenage child? So um, and we, we, we talk about this um, in this first chapter about, um, so part of it is, is this communication. Is part, part of it is, is the way we talk with kids, it's empathy and validation. But also one of the most useful things that I ever learned, I mean, when I got my PhD in childhood psychology, child psychology people assumed that I knew everything there was about parenting. <laughs> I didn't learn anything in graduate school that was useful, but I just read a lot of stuff when I had my kids were little. And one of the things that, you know, the, the, way the, the way you really communicate that you love somebody is you spend time with them and you attend to them. So, so I, I started spending I, every, every Sunday, I'd spend an hour with my son, an hour with my daughter, usually back to back. And we just do something that's kind of mutually enjoyable. And when they're little, you know, we, we'd draw, we'd color, we, we'd play. I remember <laughs> I had to be Batman when my, my son was, I had to be Robin when my son was Batman for about a year. And I, was, I kept looking at my watch, but, but, um, <laughs> It wasn't that interesting after, after a while, but, but we, I, I did something that was kind of, for the most part, mutually enjoyable. When they're older, you know, I'd play catch with them or we would go someplace, get ice cream. But the idea, the message that I gave them is that you're the most important things in the universe to me. And, and, I, and, and I want to make sure that, that there's 168 hours in a week. I want to make sure I have one for each one of you, because that's the way you really get to stay connect with people is being alone with them. And we, we also talk about, um, there's a family we know where the, the dad has these two daughters and they're just, they don't have that much in common. 
but, so, but what, what, what they did is, is he, he found a way to kind of connect whether they're interested in the theater. And they, 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 we had, they developed these family rituals you know, that, that in the you know, Friday movie night and this and that, where everybody should choose a movie different nights. So there's, there's various things that we talk about in the first chapter in our, our book about um, healing relationships and, and uh, developing a the kind of closeness that we want. And I'll also mention that one of the most powerful things we can do for kids to, 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 to really communicate respect kids is apologize to them. If, if, we, if we go off on them or we underestimate them or we, we act like I, I know better than you do, when you call that, you know, I, 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 I'm old enough now that I, I don't remember specific times, but I remember when I, when I was in my 40s, I can still remember times when my father came into to, to, to my bedroom and, and apologized for having gotten mad at me during the day. He said, look, he said, I, I was really stressed at work. I'm sorry I took it out on you. And I just, I, I, I remember how, how respected it made me feel. Okay, I'm, before I read the next question, I wanna just share that I did close the chat window because I see 20 new messages and we were not gonna go past 8.30. Um, we appreciate everyone for saying, but I wanna announce right now before more people go that um, on January 26th, um, I will be hosting a book talk on the book at McLean High School um, for as many parents as want to come. It's going to be on January 26th, like I said, in the evening. We will be talking about the book, and there, then we're going to have a, a second book talk in March. So we'll do the first half of the book and the second half of the book. So we are not finished talking about this amazing book. I'm sure we can talk about this and parenting forever. So if you don't get your question answered tonight, we will have a book talk in the future. So I'm going to go ahead and read the next question. Um, I love the suggestions about what to say to kids, but how do we get them to talk to us at all? Mine just go into their rooms and close the door and ignore me completely. If I try to initiate a conversation, they just give me perfunctory answers and try to get me to go away. I feel like you kind of answered this one, the last one. But. Well, yeah, so, so I mean, that, I mean, to telling kids, look at, I mean, that the, 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 the way, the, the research suggests that the, the way you, 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 you get close to somebody, you just spend time alone with them. I mean, you, you, can go out to, you can go out to dinner with a couple, another couple, and you get to know them. But the way you really, the really, you, you really connect is, is when you're alone with somebody. And I, I, I told my kids that when they're little, and then I, I had that one-on-one -on -one time with them until they left for college. And so I, I think letting kids know that we need to put something on the calendar. So I, I, try, I try that. Uh, also, just to try not asking, to, to, to just, just, just to, to, to uh, model model just tell, tell them you know something really something embarrassing really happened to something really embarrassing happened to work today you know I, I started to give this presentation and I realized that I just I just hadn't prepared adequately so I kind of fell my way through it I, I really I think I need I, I, got, I better do a better job next time we just make a comment like that and the kid may not say anything but you're you're, you're you, you aren't what we don't want is for all the energy coming from from the parent to try to get the kid to talk um, and, and we, we want we want to just just stop that, and we, we want. We, but oftentimes, if, if we say something, we, we, the kid will make a comment on it. Or, or if, uh, and also, try, try to spend time late at night. I mean, kids are much more likely, in my experience, to, to, to talk with their parents um, before bed. I, mean, I remember when, when I'd take my my kids home from a, a, a practice or a game. And it'd be dark. We would sit in the back seat, and and we had some of our best conversations. Just when when they're a little tired and it's dark, that that that, that we, we 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 can do better. Um, so love it. Uh, car rides and dinner time conversation. My son is 22, graduated from college, in law school now, but living back at home to save money. He, I still can't get him to talk a lot, but I, if he comes into the kitchen, I'll turn off whatever I'm listening to and just kind of say, hey. And just wait. And sometimes he will talk and sometimes he won't. But the more questions I we ask, the more they just back away, right? So we just have to like be a presence, be there. And when they wanna talk, they will. Yeah. And again, the, 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 our, our concern about it is that you know, if, if we're not close now, we'll, we'll, not, we'll never be close. You know, they, they don't, you know, this will just continue. And you know, I, I gotta turn this around. And, and for most things, we don't have to turn this, we don't have to turn around immediately. You know, the, the, we, we, got, we got some time. And, and, and generally, I mean, kids, kids change so dramatically every friggin' year as adolescents and young adults. You know, they, they, start, they aren't the same person. 
And again, so if we don't get stuck and we don't, we don't get so anxious, we're constantly peppering with questions and we can take a step back. And, and I, don't, I don't want kids in their room all the time by themselves. I mean, and and we, we, that, that's part of the family uh, collaborative problem solving or family problem solving where we bring up this issue and we figure, look, at, I, I, I can't live with myself as a parent. And I, I think that's a pretty good line, but I can't live with myself as a parent. If, I, if, if, if you're in your room all, all the time, have, 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 have not communicating at all. So we, we've got to figure out some way to have some connection here, some discussion, family dinner, that, that kind of thing. So, so I, 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 don't, I don't want to feel like I'm, a, like I'm not doing the right thing as a parent. Okay, um, the next question is very similar. So I'm gonna move on to Claudia. Thank you so much for organizing this talk. This was wonderful. Do the authors maybe have a good recommendation where teens could learn meditation? Both authors mentioned meditation to be helpful for stress resistance. So yeah, and my, so the, the two kinds of meditation that, 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 that are most commonly practiced are Mindfulness meditation, which, which, which includes a, a very, very dozens of different practices, and transcendental meditation. Um, that, that, that Ned and I, I practiced transcendental meditation for 48 years, and Ned, Ned for about 10 or 12. Um, and they're different. The, the mindful, most kids learn mindfulness meditation as kind of as, as a uh, emergency medicine, to, to, a breathing technique to, 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 to use, uh, or, or uh, when, when they're when they're, to manage their emotions, and they'd be very very effective. Or just observing their feelings, um, it can be very effective in emotional regulation. TM is something that you do twice a day, whether you feel like it or not, because over time it just it it, it, it changes your stress, it normalizes your stress response, makes you less anxious, and makes you less emotionally reactive. Um, <laughs> I. Uh, I know this kid who has autism and, and it, his mother is, is quite wealthy. They live there in New York and the kid, I think was 17 and his mom learned, learned a transcendental meditation together. And the, the mom had a reporter come, she saw, saw, saw this dramatic change in her kid and had a, re, a reporter from one of the New York papers come and write an article. And the reporter asked the kid, so what, what have you noticed from, from meditation? And the kid said, TM calms the mom, it calms the mind and it calms the mom. And so, but, but here, the, the thing is though, most kids don't want to meditate. I mean, the, the, that's just, I mean, most kids are, it's, it's not, if, if I, I, what I'm trying, what I'm going to focus on that's two, three years ago, is trying to get more meditation into schools. I'm trying to particularly transcendental meditation in the schools because kids will meditate if other kids are doing it. It's just that, that because peers are so important to adolescents, it's hard to get them to do it. But there are kids. So if, if your kids don't do it, um, that uh, learn, learn yourself. And so with TM, you, you, you learn it from a certified instructor. There's some really good TM teachers in Northern Virginia. With, with mindfulness, um, there, there are kids who use mindfulness apps. Um, and um, uh, what, what's that? Um, I can't remember. The, There's the, the Calm app. I have, I have like four of them on my phone right now. Some okay. of them require a subscription, like to get the really good um, meditation. But you can do like meditations one every day or you know there's shorter ones five minutes 10 minutes that kind of thing so apps are really good for that yeah and i and i i think that, that, that again that, that what that they're very different different meditations have very different effects and they're very different practices um and i think there's, there's value in, in, in a lot of different meditations but in terms of getting kids to do it i i think that that, that we learn to we, we develop our practice ourselves i think we're more likely to influence our, our, our kids to, to do it um, uh, so I know, um, a couple of parents who started it with their children when they were like in fifth or sixth grade as a bedtime routine with them just to do like the 10 minute meditation every night before bed. And that kind of gets this, the child used to doing it and seeing like it's a part of their routine. So <laughs> that's a really good point, Kathleen. And we said it every night. I mean, I, I, I saw this, I, I followed this kid for years, um, with autism and when he's a senior in high school his, his parents said we we do as a family we do yoga nidra which is a relaxation technique a yoga based relaxation technique we do this together as a family and it, and it makes his day completely different and i asked the obvious question why don't you do it every day <laughs> you know? but so i i do think that developing practices practices that allow us to throw off more stress than we're taking on are really beneficial it's not easy to get kids to do it, but, but the more we can build it into schools, the, 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 the better it will be. 
Okay, the next question. How do you get your teenage boy to help out at home, do chores, clean up his room, not talk back or swear at us? <laughs> so um, so you, you focus on not trying to change him. The, 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 the chapter in our book on the language and silence of change. I, I really love the chapter because it just, it, it focuses on the reality. You really can't change somebody against their will. And so when a parent asks that, they're saying, how do I get my kid to change? And, and, with the, the, that, and you can't really. So what, what, what I suggest is, is we go back to collaborative problem solving about chores. We, 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 and and there, there are some kids who, who won't do, they won't clean up the bathroom, but they will do the dishes three nights a week. So we would give them some kind of chore. And, and we realize it doesn't have to be perfect. And if we have to pick up the slack sometimes, it's not the end of the world. Um, and we, but we, we, we work out, ideally, we work out a plan for chores. And then if kids are treating us disrespectfully, then we, 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 don't, we, don't, we don't say, you, you can't talk to me like that. that that's not, that, if it didn't work the first time, you said that, it's not going to work you know, the, the 10th or 12th time. And so what we, wanted, we want to model assertiveness. And one of the ways the things we can do is say that, you know um, I don't let people talk to me like that. So I, I, I'm going to go into my room for a little bit. I'm going to go for a walk and I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk to you after you cool down like that. Um, or you, you say, you know, somebody attacks me. It's really stressful for me. And I, I'd like to be able to solve this with, with you, but I can't solve it now because I'm, I'm, I'm stressed and I can't think straight. I'm going to take a break. Um, and, and I think it's also okay to say, look at, um, you know, if you treat me disrespectfully, it makes it, it really lows my motivation you know, to, pick, to, to pick you up at practice or, or, or to, to wake you up in the morning. And I, so I, I think things will go better between the two of us. If you treat more respectfully, then it's, it'll be easier for me to do that. I'll be more motivated to do the things that, that, that I can do that, that are really helpful to you. Um, I love that. I, I would also add, pick your battles. Like with my kids, I just closed the door to their bedrooms and just let it go. <laughs> everyone has their their what what they're able to tolerate but you know if he's taking out the trash and doing a couple other things then maybe his room we can just close the door on that and maybe help him clean it out a couple times a year my daughter's room when she's in high school looked, looked like a schizophrenic I mean, literally I, I could i could hardly literally there's no place to walk and and you know and and I just told her that if we have company or something, if I see you know, rodents in your road, then, then, then that's a different story. But I said, as, as long as you can live with this, this is your room. And as long as you have company over, you close the door. And what I do is about once a month, I'd say, you want a little help with your room? And she said, yeah. So I go down on Saturday morning and I'd help her clean up her room. And it was really, it was fun. It was, and it was really it was the time we, we'd talk. And I think it was, it was really, she, she's not the neatest housekeeper now. But I'll tell you, she's got she's got a wonderful husband and three beautiful children, um, and uh, and I wouldn't trade the neatness for the kind of love that these kids experience. And uh, so. thank you, Nikita is asking, how do you get your teenager to listen in general and to listen to even come for a vacation with you? They refuse and prefer being at home with electronics slash friends. Well, you know, I, I think that um, you know, as, as somebody who, as a teenager, uh, frequently chose to, to stay home, <laughs> and, and, and uh, yeah, I, it's hard for me to say, oh, you, you, you got to talk him into it. Uh, but I, I think that, um, that, that I, again, that it's something that you, you kind of work on, you kind of work at, about, uh, and, and certainly, you know, is, is, there some, is there some place you'd really like to go? I mean, getting kids involved in, in the planning process. And, 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 and the empathy, that empathy and non-judgment, you know, and, and what, what, what I tell kids is, you know, I, I said, you know, after puberty, peers become like crack cocaine in your brain. Just even, even seeing a picture of your friends, even just thinking about your friends, you get this big, big spike in dopamine. Which in knowing that, we can, be, we can, be, we can express empathy about that, that, that I, I get why. And also it's important for, for, for me that we, that we do some stuff as a family. And I'd love your input here, what would work best for you. But again, we kind of, we work it out. 
Yeah, and, and, I, and I think that if, if you feel it's unsafe to leave a kid home or you feel that you don't feel right about a kid is going to be doing electronics 24-7, if you don't feel right about it, say that that's, a, that's not going to work for me. And, and whether it's, it's getting a grandparent involved or a neighbor involved to, to kind of to work out some kind of agreement where the kid's not doing that all day. But again, it's something that we work out over time as opposed to thinking that we always know best. We, 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 um, we have to work out immediately. And... Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm getting pretty hungry. I, I need to eat dinner. So oh, yeah, me let, yeah. let, 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 Okay. Let me, take, let me take one more question. One more question. All right, let's see. Um, let's see. And, and if you want, I mean, if, 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 if it was my calendar a lot, I'd be happy to join you at the, the book talk and at the end and take some questions. Oh, yeah, and... absolutely. Okay. Um, let's see. Am I, this is, let's do this last question. One more technology question. Am I preventing my kid from learning his own lessons if I lock the network slash devices during or what should be sleeping hours? So my feeling is that you, you don't want to be doing that. Uh, the, um, <laughs> you don't want to send a kid off to college if you're still doing it. Um, and so but with little kids, the, the idea, sure, with, with younger kids, should let, let's do that. And then let's say, you know, that my goal for you is that you're is for you to be able to run your own life and and, and i want you i want you to wrestle with this because that it, it's hard for adults i mean so, so many adults just binge watch stuff and they, they, they say way too late and um and this this is hard for adults and i i, I think that um so right, right so you set limits on it fine but the goal then is is that to give kids practice wrestling with themselves and say, well, let's, let's go. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to turn, let, leave it on for a week. Let's see how it goes. Let's go, let, let's see how this goes. And we'll, we'll talk about it. And, and if, if you're managing it well, and I don't need to do it, terrific. You know, if, 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 if that, that pull, because it's so addictive, if that pull is just too strong, you know, it's not like you're a weekly. It's just like half the planet has trouble with this or three quarters of the planet has trouble with this. But it just means that, 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 that I, I need to help you regulate it um, uh, a bit longer. So again, it's, it's, that, it's that we transition from the kind of monitor setting, the setting limits to, to, to letting kids practice, making decisions, learning from mistakes. So um, it, 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 you, just, you just don't want to be getting a kid out of bed and, 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 and managing their technology uh, up until the time they go to college, because then there's, they'll be back home by November. All right, Bill, if you would drop the link to purchase your book in the chat window, um, the last person share asked if this recording is going to be shared and where it's going to be shared. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to email out, I'm going to send this to Longfellow, the recording. I'm going to send it with, share it with our PTSA, and I'm going to email it out to all parents within the next couple of days at McLean. Um, and then along with information about the January 26th book talk that we'll be having, um, focusing on this book. So you will be receiving an email soon and I'm sure it will be posted in many places. I'll let you know in the email where it's gonna be posted. We haven't exactly figured that out yet, but it will be available for people to watch. Yeah. And I'm embarrassed to say that I forgot <laughs> about the link but oh, okay. it's, it's probably not a great surprise. I mean, that, that Ned and I are huge fans of politics and prose in DC. And I don't know whether, whether in, in Northern Virginia, maybe McLean, there's an independent bookstore. We, we love independent bookstores. Uh, but also there's, there's something called Amazon. I mean, you, it's, you, you, it, it's not a hard book to find. Okay. Yeah. Can, you, can you hear you, Kathleen? I just posted the link in the chat window. I found it for oh. y'all. Um, oh, wait, that's a direct message. Hang on, everyone in the meeting. Hang on, let me do that again. There we go. Okay, so everyone should see that. Um, Dr. Stixer, thank you so much for being with us. We learned a lot and we are very much looking forward to talking more about your book and, and getting better as parents every day. Have a great night. I love the way you think, Kathleen. <laughs> it's, it's great, it's, We're a good it's great team. To be, yeah, it's great to be with you. Bye. Bye-bye.